Today is the 4th of June and the time is 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Priyadeshni Marathe, focus lead at Oxford's Emergency Department. And the theme for today's discussion is the use of point of care ultrasound around airway management. As acute care and emergency care physicians, managing a patient's airway is one of the top skills that we need to have. And what better way than to make it easier to plan, perform, and also use point of care ultrasound to prevent complications around airway management. So today we've got five great presentations for you where we will discuss some of these points. Our first presenter today is Dr. Yasser Mohammed. Yasser, over to you. Um, so a bit of background. So the, the talk of today is going to be about the future of airway, airway management in ED. And um, uh, and hopefully we can get some uh, learning points out of this. So we're going to start by a quick case study. 34 year old female, two weeks postpartum. Known case of insulin dependent diabetes, hypothyroid and major depressive disorder. She is brought in by ambulance after collapse at, shop at shopping center with a GCS of 11 and normal pupils. She was a bit hypotensive, tachycardic and tachypneic and desaturating on 15 liters. Temperature 36.5 and a BM was normal. She has an IV in place with one liter of normal saline running. So, um, out of the top of your head, differentials that you can think of for this 34 year old postpartum with shock. So a lot of differences came on, um, but I'm sure many of you would be thinking, could this be VTE? So, as usual, We'll, why not get the ultrasound and check if there's any signs of VTE? Um, we do a rush protocol, which is rapid ultrasound in shock. And this is a really good protocol for the undifferentiated hypotensive patients, UHP. So any undifferentiated hy hypotensive patient, whether you're querying septic or not septic versus cardiogenic or not, a rush protocol is a very useful clinical assessment tool that you can add uh, to, your, to your clinical judgment and clinical assessments. So a rush protocol was done and as you can see on the image on the left of the screen, um, you can see dilated RV more so than the than the LV, which is very RV dilation is very consistent with a PE. And on a short axis per sternal view, you can see flattening of the intervent interventricular septum with a D sign. So this patient, in, in, in fact, did have a PE. So you've diagnosed PE. What's next? You confirm the VTE, and then you ask the medical student to return the ultrasound machine because it's taking too much space in your recess. And then as the medical student is pushing the ultrasound machine out of the room, the patient arrests. So what you should do, what should you do next? The obvious answer is get the ultrasound machine back. You cannot have a recess without ultrasound machine. You need to go and get the probe. So you grab the probe and then the team is managing the arrest as per standard guidelines and CPR is ongoing. And they say this patient was desatting, massive PE is likely. So we are intubating this patient while we're arranging thrombolysis and so forth. So while the airway doctor was preparing for intubation, you extend your probe, lightly place, in, place it on the suprasternal notch. And I got this image just for you to be aware, the ultrasound uh, doctor, uh, th this is where he's positioned, 
However, if he wants this, this position is for a field protocol, which is focused echo in emergency life support, where you can do a subzephoid view of the heart while uh, uh, during the 10 second rhythm checks. However, if you want to do an ultrasound for the airway, you go to the top of the bed at the left side of the chest comp uh, of the person doing chest compressions and you just place the probe over the suprasternal notch. So you were interested on, a, on, on the assessment of the airway and you decided I'll do suprasternal uh, ultrasound to see what the airway doctor is doing with his intubation. And then you go on in, and then on the first attempt you see this. And for everyone to get an idea what's going on, basically you have your ultrasound probe here aiming to the patient with the marker aiming to the patient right. And this is the trachea with the thyroid gland on top of it. With this trachea, because it's full of air, you see an air mucosal interface, which is that white line and air underneath it. And as you know, air used to be the enemy of ultrasound, not until you're doing lung ultrasound, but it used to be. And that's why you cannot see much of ultra, much, much uh, image behind the trachea. So this is the trachea with the air mucosal interface. And then to the left of the trachea, which is the most 70% of the population have their esophagus to the left of the trachea. Usually it's somewhere around there. You see that trachea getting filled with something. So now what you see is a double tracheal sign. You should only see one trachea in, in an airway ultrasound. But if you see a double trachea, what looks like a double trachea, know that someone has put an airway into a place where he shouldn't, which is the esophagus. You should only see one trachea, not two tracts. So what do you do? Do you wait for him to be secured and, and tie the CO2 and then ventilate it and, back, uh, and then inflating his stomach? Or do you just tell him to, well, you just intubated the esophagus in real time? So you feed back to the airway doctor and you tell him, I can see a tube going down the esophagus. Can you give it another shot? And he does that. And then look at the tube now. Going into the trachea. The, the esophagus is there. It's that, that small circle with many circles inside. You don't see any double tracheal sign, anything showing on the left of the esophagus. So the second attempt of intubation was actually successful. We do not have to back the patient. We do not have to connect him to enzyme the CO2. We do not have to get any, we do not even have to auscultate while bagging. It was an instantaneous real-time feedback with correction of tube placement without the patient desaturating or having any adverse event. And for everyone to get aware of what this looks like, esophageal intubation versus normal intubation. This is the double tracheal sign, double tract sign of an esophageal intubation. This is a single tract, meaning the air, the ET tube actually went in place where it should. So you do not have to identify the esophagus per se if you couldn't see it because it's collapsed the muscular tube. But what you need to identify is the trachea and the surrounding structure with the tracheal links and and the thyroid on top of it, and then you will see a small structure there, which is likely to be the esophagus. However, all of this is just extra. What you really need to focus on is the trachea being intubated and not a second tract or second trachea forming. And that's how you rule out esophageal intubation. And by that, the tube has went to the, to the airway. Is there any evidence for this? Is this just something really new? that people are just discovering about this? Absolutely not. This was a meta-analysis, a systematic review with a meta-analysis that was done in 2018 of all the studies that, that investigated this question. And the studies go back to 2005 and even before that. 
And this systematic review excluded any case reports or case series or retrospective studies. So it was only for prospective studies and RCTs. And it had a total of 1,595 patients. And uh, um, all of them analyzed in this meta-analysis. 15 of which were prospective studies and two of which were randomized controlled trials. 12 were in ED and eight were in, uh, 12 in ED and five were in the operating room. There were 17 studies in total. Eight studies were using a dynamic technique, which is a technique I just described during intubation, while nine used a static technique uh, where you can do, let the intubation take place and then scan the, the neck. There is no significant difference between either techniques, whether you use dynamic or, or static. I prefer dynamic technique. The sonographers were emergency physicians, 13% of the studies, so these are not radiologists, these are not sonographers. These are not anyone other than emergency physicians, and actually only in three studies, there were anesthetists. Anesthesiologists in three studies, and one study was not described. So this is by far an emergency physician developed point of care ultrasound. So let's get to the numbers. How sensitive over all these studies was an ultrasound to detect uh, intratracheal intubation? It ranged between 97.8 to 99.2. Mean is around 98.7% sen sensitive to detect an intratracheal intubation. And 97.1% specific to detect an intratracheal intubation. And had an area under the curve uh, of 0.994. The, um, the overall esophageal intubation rate was high, so it was 15% of all these intubations were esophageal. And there was, uh, and I want to, to point this out, there was no significant difference in accuracy between this, these studies with respect to the training protocol used, the ultrasound technique used, or the sonographer experience, whether that be a medical student who was taught this or an ultrasound fellow who was taught this. So it has a very good learning curve that people can catch up on fairly quickly and easily. So why airway ultrasound is such a good option? I'll just highlight two very important points. The first is that it's, it detects certificate intubation in real time, even before ventilating the patient. Hence, you're avoiding any unnecessary forced ventilation to the stomach and its, and its associated complications. Moreover, capnography. Capnography has been the gold standard. However, there are always pitfalls and capnography is, also has pitfalls. Because it depends on pulmonary blood flow, whenever you have a massive PE or a cardiac arrest, it's less reliable. And in some studies, it had a, a sensitivity of 65 to 68% in cardiac arrest. So not very sensitive in conditions where you where the pulmonary blood flow is compromised. However, it stays to be very useful. It remains to be very useful. And obviously, chest X-ray just takes a lot of time. We do not want any chest X-ray to confirm anything. Uh, ultrasound is a great option instead. OK, so I've talked about the evidence and I've talked about why ultrasound. But is it adopted by international guidelines? Is it something that anyone has endorsed? Well, actually, yes. This has been in the LCOR guidelines, the International Liaison Committee for uh, of Resuscitation, and it's adopted by ACLS. Ultrasound for ETT confirmation has been added in 2015, five years back. So to sum it up, simply all you need to do is place the prop over the suprasternal notch, Watch the ultrasound machine as the intubation is attempted, and then feed back if you see a double track. And that's it. Thank you all for listening. And this is my, these are my references. Thanks, Yasser. That was a great presentation. Are there any questions for Yasser? Or, or anything else that people would like to, to discuss? It's quite uh, simple.
much like Yasu said, all you have to do is use the high frequency probe, put it on the suprasternal notch, and as the tube is going in, check if there's a double tracked sign. And if it isn't, then it's probably going down the right tube. Um, Karim wants to ask a question. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, sorry, I think you've already answered it. It was just to confirm what probe do you normally use? You use the linear one, high frequency. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on your uh, how comfortable you are with it, but I would say some experts have have advised to use a curvilinear probe because it gives a wider footprint versus the linear probe. Um, but 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 you can use either. Linear prop obviously gives you a very high resolution image. Uh, it's 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 a high frequency prop, but it gives you very low uh, depth. You don't need much depth, but the advantage of curvy linear is that it gives you a wider footprint. Um, my advice, also a, a bit of a tip here, is that even if you cannot visualize the esophagus being incubated or any of that, and if you're suspecting it, you can slide your prop a bit towards the left side and then scan there because the esophagus, you will be able to visualize the esophagus more onto the left, which is the majority of the population. And some experts actually, the same way you move the trachea to intubate, after you intubate, you can move the trachea to the right and push the trachea and then ultrasound. And then you'll see there's an esophagus that's behind the trachea and obscured. So there are many tricks that you can use. Um, so you can you can not only mobilize, you can look from the left side, look from the right side, on uh, behind the trachea, and it's a very simple thing uh, to do. Really, it doesn't need a lot of technique. Thanks, yes, sir. I'd, I'd be really interested to see it in action because I've never seen it being done. Um, mm -hmm. if, if from your experience, does it, especially with a curvilinear probe? Does it a ever hinder uh, any other maneuvers that you want to do, like a burp or a cricoid, or uh, have you found that that still is possible? So very good question. Um, because you're placing the probe just suprasternally, you're not placing it over the tracheal cartilage. Probably not the best day to wear a turtleneck, but you cannot because you're not placing it over the tracheal cartilage. You're not. You're not changing anything. Anyone who wants to manipulate the trachea can do so. And after they intubate, uh, uh, you can do your trachea manipulation if you want to. That's just a tip that I've, I've seen been used. It's very useful, uh, which you can use when the esophagus is behind, not to the left of the trachea, but behind the trachea. To just visualize that, you can slide your prop to the left or mobilize the trachea a bit and then visualize behind it. Very nice tricks. You usually do not need that. Usually it's very obvious, uh, but it's just an extra tip. It does not uh, prevent anyone from uh, uh, doing a birth maneuver because it's super externally. And even if someone does not want you to ultrasound because something new and not everyone can it, uh, and people are still grabbing on the ultrasound now, you can do it after the intubation. You can tell them, do your capnography, do your auscultation. I'll just slide a small prop and you carry on what you're doing. And then on that prop, you'll probably pick up if there was a double track before the capnography picks up. And then you can tell them, well, actually, I think this is in the esophagus before the capnography reads. Thanks, great, that's great, Yasser. Thank you so much. Um, we've got Helen, who's our next speaker. Helen, are you here? Muted. It's muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Right. You you can go ahead with your presentation. Yes. So I'm going to share my screen. Um. <laughs> so basically. Uh, okay. Great. Can you see it all? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So let's continue with the same patient that we just intubated as uh, Yasser just did and well presented. So basically, if we continue, so the same clinical case, we just intubated her. So now we confirmed that we were in the endotracheal. OK, so we were in the track. Now, how can you make sure that you're not you have not gone too far or within like only one branch or 
just make sure that you're at the right place and that you are um, ventilating both lungs. So basically you can confirm that you're ventilating both lungs. If you see some sliding bilaterally, if you see some A lines versus B lines, if you see any lines, it means that you have a contact between two the two pleura. So you will be able to see um, basic, basically both lungs, you'll be able to confirm that both lungs are ventilated and you'll be able to see the comet tails. Just as a recap, okay? So when you take your probe, okay, you take your marker, the marker is always towards the head, you put it longitudinally on the chest, so you have a vertical view. So marker is my thumb vertical on the chest, and then you slide that way. So as a recall, just a recap here, you will have a view of two coastal ribs, okay, here and here, and you will see the long, the pleura, right between the two ribs and their shadow. And just as a recap, if your marker is towards the head of the patient, so the head of the patient will be on the left side of your screen and the feet will be towards the right, right? So what does it look like? Okay, a normal appearance, just to recap a bit. So you will see if you place your probe in that orientation, you will see two ribs, okay, and their respective shadows. You will see the pleura lying atop of the lung, okay? So here, on the top of the screen, you will have some, uh, some um, subcutaneous tissue, some muscles, intercostal uh, muscles. You have the pleura here, which is um, a thin, bright and white um, with line, basically, that lies atop of the lung. You will see some small speckles on it, which are called the comet tails, and they will move back and forth with each breath, okay? So what does it look like? Here you have, so these, this is a normal lung. So you have the two, the two ribs, okay? One on each side, you have the pleura here, okay? And you have the reverberation. So basically if the pleura is normal, it will act like a mirror. So then you will see, like on the second image here, you will see just the reflection of the pleura all the way down the screen, okay? Here is another, image of a normal lung as well. So you can see the comet tails a bit better in this video. Comet tails here, um, so that are a little bit, little speckles on the top, and then you see the sliding. So basically, if you see the comet tails and you see some A lines, it means that you have some contact. That's the point. You have contact between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. As a little, another just point to, to catch here, basically if you see some B lines, it means that you have a contact. So it means that you have no air preventing the sliding between the, the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. So if you right away see some B lines, you're able to say that there is no air, therefore there is no pneumothorax. So then, or you are able to say that there, there is some sliding on both sides of the lungs. Right? So just as a recap, B lines as compared to A lines are long, okay, artifact, vertical. They start from the pleura, they, they go down uh, deep in, on the screen, okay, and they don't attenuate, so they don't lose their energy, right? So focal B lines are just kind of isolate, isolated B lines, and here you have a waterfall appearance, confluent B lines a lot a lot of water basically it means that your lungs are wet so back to our patient about 30 minutes after the intubation well you were still waiting for the chest x-ray that was ordered um, as a protocol and then your uh, your your patient starts to desaturate she's now at 84 percent on the ventilator you recheck your parameters on the ventilators they're still okay and then you use your mnemotechnic your mnemotechnic you use the dope so ruling out a displacement, an obstruction, a pneumothorax, or an equipment failure. And if you use your ultrasound, you can definitely rule out a displacement or a pneumothorax, right? So here is what we will look like. Let's say that the patient has something wrong on the left, on the left lung, okay? So here is the normal lung, okay, on the right side. So if you place your probe, you're looking at 
your right side. Here you have a normal lung, so you can see the sliding, the comet tails, the A lines and everything. But look at that. On the left side, you have something totally different. Can you see the difference? So here you don't have any comet tails. You cannot see the sliding. The vertical movement, it's just because of the musc the muscles of the of the of the of the chest, basically of the thorax. They try to basically they move. OK, they try to patients start try to breathe. The machine makes you try to breathe, but there's something preventing the lungs from being inflated and moving. So there is something wrong. So here is a classical image of a pneumothorax, OK, or a right side, a right side intubation, basically a lung not being ventilated, right? And just for your curiosity, here is a really nice video. Here you can see the sternum, OK, on the left side of the video with its shadow going down. Here you can see some inter, um, just intercostal um, vessels. OK, so you have some vessels here and then you can see the lung. So it's even possible to see all the structures on the on the ultrasound. So after that, the famous M mode, OK? So the M mode, M stands for motion, motion compared to B, to the B mode for brightness or bidimensional, OK? Bidimension, two dimensions. So the M mode, what it makes. So basically your probe is there. It takes a single, a single crystal from the probe and it draws a line down the screen. So the line, OK, is the line you see here on the screen on the bit on the on the on the shot on the on the image so usually in real life this will move okay so it takes a line and the line okay is producing a clip and it repeats what the line sees right you bear with me so if the line is seeing some normal movement it will create this appearance here the chest wall is not supposed to move, right? It moves a bit, but it's not supposed to move as, as extremely as the, um, as, as the lung, right? In a normal patient, as we saw. So you will have what we call the seashore sign. So the, the portion that is moving, it's like the sand, okay? So you're on a beach, your feet are there, okay? You're on a beach, you're set on a beach, and then you have your sand, okay, here, which is the portion of the, of the lung. And here you have the water, OK? So it looks like waves coming towards the beach, right? Some people call it the sand beach sign or the sandy beach, whatever you call it. It means that you have a, a normal movement of your uh, of your lung. On the other hand, if you have a pneumothorax or a non ventilated um, lung, you'll have a barcode. You won't have any movement of the lung, right? So you'll have a barcode. So only single lines from the top till the bottom of the of the um, of the of the screen. Some people call it um, the stratosphere sign. I don't really catch it, to be fair. Uh, to be honest, I prefer the barcode. <laughs> so barcode sign. And just for a reference here for you to just to better visualize the differences between on the same patient here, the differences between both lungs. So you have here, here the seashore, the normal signs, and here you have the barcode. And then how can you make sure that you have a pneumothorax or not? The definitive sign to make sure you have a pneumothorax is the long point. The long point is basically the point where you can see the difference between a long moving and a long, well, no, no movement, right? So here, I don't know if you can see on the, on the video, here you have a nor on the right side of the video, you have a normal lung movement and there is a point okay where you can see that the lung is moving okay so this is basically where the point where the lung is deflated or the lung doesn't the lung doesn't touch basically the the visceral pleura doesn't touch the parietal pleura anymore bear with me in some occasions you can even have a double lung point this is quite nice so it means that you have a portion of the lung that is touching the, the, the where the visceral pleura is touching the parietal pleura, and then you would have air on both sides. 
So it looks like that, okay? So let's say that you have a double long point here. So you have a bit of long touching the normally the pleura. So you have a contact between both pleura, okay? And you have air on both sides. Otherwise, this is the regular long point, basically. This the point where the lung is not touching anymore, where the visceral, the pleuras are not touching themselves anymore. And then finally, you'll have the hard point or the lung pulse. But I'm afraid you will have to stay with us because we will talk about it shortly with another presenter. So as usual, many thanks for your listening. And uh, don't hesitate to catch me on the, show, on the show floor, ask me any questions or to Twitter me. Um, we, we all are, we are all um, ultra, uh, ultrasound and focus lovers so please let's go and crack on and grab your probe and boom it <laughs> thank you thanks helen that was a great presentation so we've learned about uh mode and long point our next presenter is conrad are you here if you can hear me i'm here yes yes i can hear you okay Ready for your screen share? Okay. Where would screen share be right now? Raise yeah. my hand, put me on hold. I actually got the screen share earlier. Does anyone have okay. any questions in the meantime? One. Can people see my screen? Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Is there any questions for Elaine? I think there is a single point that uh, I just wanted to, to emphasize that Helen said, which is confirming endotracheal um, and endobronchial intubations. Um, so ultrasound is very. Do, do you want to? Do you want to wait? To maybe at the end of mine, and then maybe I cover that or not? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not going to speak about the lung after. pulse. No, no, I'm not going to speak about the lung pulse or any of that. I'm just gonna. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize that this is the point that Helen made is very important and should be in everyone's mind. That ultrasound is very quick in detecting one-sided intubation versus uh, an endotracheal precranial intubation, which is important in kids you don't want to be ventilating a one child's lung for 20 minutes until you get the x-ray so that's where the importance of ultrasound comes uh, back to you Connor. okay thanks, thanks Connor. Yeah. uh so where helena stops i'm going on so i'm going to uh -huh. make a new case of a patient who we had in icu there's just the background she was 58 years old she came in post lap for acute mesenteric ischemia and she intra-op she had no concerns the uh, anesthetist when they handed her over said, well, she had really good ventilation, oxygenation, pressures were fine. And then on the, en route, uh, she was getting a bit much with the pressures and she needed some vasopressors. And then she got to us, they needed to just hand it over. As we were handing over, uh, every time we were handing over, there's a little bit up on the pressures, the tidal volumes are dropping, up on the um, up on the vasopressors, the blood pressure was dropping. And it was continuously going, handover was done, and Ethos said, job well done, and they left. And that's exactly when things started really getting troublesome for us. And Helena already spoke about the airway check, the dope, the dope system. And we went through that because now this lady is in front of us and she is a unique, very short, very short neck, obese patient. And we checked the tube, the tube was 22 centimeters of teeth. And we all thought, well, that is an adequate length for her. Uh, it could pass a suction catheter, it wasn't kinking. There was no obstruction and her pressures were just jumping up and up and up. And we were starting to get into high peak and plateau pressure. So we thought, well, even though she had soft luring, did she have a pneumothorax? And we requested an x-ray and this is routinely um, kept blank because the x-ray wasn't available yet. Uh, and this is where the ultrasound was needed. So we look for pleural sliding. We've covered this numerous times. So there's two answers to the pleural sliding. Is there pleural sliding? Yes or no? And what means it in you? Yes. If they're touching and sliding with all the signs Elena showed, that means you've got a healthy pleura and they are touching each other and then lung underneath. What no means is we taught initially that it means no, uh, there's a pneumothorax, but it only means there's a pneumothorax if there's features that there's air in between. So sometimes a pleura cannot slide 
And there's reasons either stuck, and in South Africa we saw it a lot with TB. Patients post-TB have um, almost an autopleurodesis from the inflammation, and they still got underlying bad lungs, or the lung is not moving. Either it is atelectatic, or it has a um, really diseased process going on in terms of a dense pneumonia. So we are not bad at getting seeing pleural sliding. I think Prof. Rahman, the last name that you have there, is an Oxford person who's a really fun guy to chat to. And we they have over and over said that we you don't need a lot of training to look at pleural sliding. You can novices can pick it up, but only when it becomes troublesome. Easy good pleural sliding is easy to see. But when it comes troublesome, it might take some experience. And so we saw this in this patient, and we then saw the lung pulse sign. And that made us really reevaluate her, and we changed some things. So this is uh, the first time I've played with my toy. This is my interpretation of how to draw a lung pulse sign. I've got a new toy with my iPad, and if it's not the best picture you've ever seen, please excuse me, I'm learning. But so basically what the lung pulse sign is, is if you got a intubated lung, let's let's use the concept that this patient had of a right endobronchial intubation. The left side becomes immediately and within minutes severely atelectatic. There's resorption atelectasis. The, the air that was there is all gone into from the alveolar into the tissues and the lung becomes like a less dense sponge. So the, the tissues become dense. And what that then means that there's the cardiac pulsations are transmitted and it gets to the pleura. Now, this is a picture of it being an M mode, and in brightness mode, you'll see the whole pleura light up if you have got a pleural view, in keeping and in sync with cardiac oscillations, not with respiratory effort and not with ventilatory effort. So now that the um, lungs have become this conductor of um, pulsations rather than being actually um, ventilatory changes in the pleura, so the pleura gets moved, but from the conducted beats, from the cardiac oscillations. And you, a good way to try to check your timing is if you've got a 3 lead ECG connected to your ultrasound machine and you can see the correlation between cardiac oscillations and the lung pleural sign. So this is basically what happened with her. We, this is not a, her picture, but her picture was very similar. Every time she had a cardiac beat, there was lung oscillation or the pleural changes. We realized that she has features of left endobronchial or right endobronchial intubation with left collapse. However, when we went to her airway, we couldn't understand that she had a 22 centimeter good looking tube. And unfortunately, in this case, when the, because we were worried that everything else is pointing to it, can we trust our ultrasound? She had an x-ray, which isn't that unfortunate. And she did have a right endobronchial intubation. Now, if we, and th this is a learning point for me now, I trusted, didn't trust the ultrasound because the other things that make sense. And uniquely in her, when she was in, intubated in theater, her neck position caused it to be, a, a tip of the tube was right at the carina, and her neck position influenced, she was hyperextended, and the ET tube was outside the left bronchus. Once they put her off her pillow and onto ICU in a more neutral position, it slipped down the right main bronchus and her actual area which she needed the ET tube to so short was 18 centimeters. So we removed the ET tube to 18 centimeters and very, very early, uh, all the parameters came much, much better. And that was the first time I used lung pulse sign, saw lung pulse sign and didn't trust it. But in the end, I've gone over and over in this. And I think if you do have your features and you're starting to get confidence in your ultrasound, that you can use the lung pulse sign as a feature of endobronchial intubation. Now, it's just important to notice that, or to know that not all things, not all atelectasis look the same. There are about eight different types of atelectasis. And the one that I've got on the one side there is the obstructive atelectasis. And once you've got that obstruction, the process of atelectasis, when air is trapped, and I've got a picture of static air bronchogram, once the static air bronchogram, all the fluids absorbed, then it all, all the air is absorbed. It could be filled with fluid. And then you get something called a fluid bronchogram, which is the one video I have for you. So this is the patient we have. We had pneumonia. And you can see in the middle there, there is a collection of fluid, post-acoustic enhancement, and it is dynamic. So static versus dynamic, 
if these genomics are statically installed, dynamic fluid, so we have a patient here with a dynamic fluid bronchogram from pneumonia. That should be the short, long and short of it. So the learning points I had from this case was the ET depth was not just 22, which is standard. She actually needed a very shorter one and learned about the ultrasound changes of atelectasis, not only the obstructive one, but the um, compression one that you see with around uh, pleural effusions. I didn't know there were eight different types of atelectasis. And then I, with the, along with my colleague, who's a physiotherapist here, also was doing lung ultrasound, we gain more diagnostic confidence for future decisions. That should be about it. Let me just. Thanks, Conrad. That's thank that was you. excellent. That um, was nine minutes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the learning point here is that if we change the position of the patient after a tube or a cannula is placed, then the and if one end of the tube or cannula is secured to skin or in this case the mouth and it's free to move so it can change its position i do have this problem sometimes when i've put uh, iv cannulas under ultrasound guidance um, and we put them in a page in the patient's extended arm but for example when they go off to ct their arms are lifted up and above their head and placed behind their head. Uh, and then the position of mm -hmm. the course changes. Sometimes it gets pulled out of the vein. Um, and we must keep in mind that cha changing the anatomy will change the uh, end of the tube inside the patient's body. That was an excellent case. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Questions there for Conrad? Uh, there is a question here. Do the mind ray machines have a, have the ECG attachment? Yes, they do. All of them. Uh, the, our next presenter is Judson. Are Hello. you there, Judson? Yeah. Hi, yeah. hi. Hey. Yeah, we're ready for your screen share. Are you able to see my screen? Not just yet. No. Yes. Excellent. So my topic is man versus machine. It's basically an algorithm for troubleshooting post intubation desaturation in patients. So this is a patient I managed a long time ago in India. Uh, she was a 37 year old female known to have diabetes. Came in with cough and fever for the past eight days, became really short of breath in the last 24 hours, was intubated at her local hospital and was transferred to us uh, for ICU, ICU care. She was not maintaining her saturations. Her saturation was 75%. She was quite sick and she was intubated. So this was at handover at mid in the at midnight. There were two other cardiac arrests going on, so uh, it was kind of a very busy scenario where we didn't have time to focus on all aspects of this patient. But then we tried our best, and uh, I'll just share what we did in this uh, to this patient. So man versus machine. So the two things we are looking at uh, in terms of patient desaturating, uh, desaturating. So the things about the machine are, we looked at the tube, if the tube was displaced, basically the same DOPS pneumonic. Uh, we used the laryngoscope to see that the tube was in place. We saw the tube was obstructed. We did suctioning to you know, clear the tube. She was having a lot of secretions. In the end, we decided to change the tube because uh, we thought maybe the tube was blocked and because she had so much of uh, secretions. And then we also uh, did a lung protective strategy because we thought she had ARDS. Uh, uh, we made sure her tidal volume was okay. We increased her FiO2. We went up on the PEEP. So basically we did as much as we could to optimize the machine settings. 
and with all of these from 75 percent her saturation went up to 82 percent but she was still sick and we couldn't get her saturation up so the causes of patient having problems which might lead to desaturation so the man problems or patient problems, pneumothorax, lung collapse, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolus, bronchospasm, all these differentials came to mind. And so we just did an ultrasound of her lungs and on her right in uh, mid axillary line, this is what we saw. Thus the diaphragm, the liver below and above, if you can see, there's some fluid with debris just swirling around. So I just put a needle into that space because it looks like a huge collection and there was and it was full of pus, uh, just yellowish, yellowish and dark gray, thick substance that I could aspirate. So we immediately put a chest drain into that place and her saturation came up and her vitals also improved. So basically the take home point of my slide is in a patient who has, who is intubated and you want to troubleshoot or you're having difficulty in um, getting their saturation up, ultrasound can help with all the causes that the patient might have to detect patients problems that could be hindering uh, good ventilation. So pneumothorax, we've already heard, pulmonary edema, we've heard previously, uh, Yasser has talked about pulmonary embolus, and my, uh, my patient had a lung collapse because of the effusion, and in mine, it was particularly empyema. And uh, so basically, ultrasound is such an easy and uh, quick and efficient tool by the bedside to uh, rule out or find out patient, uh, if there are any causes that the patient might be having that might be uh, causing them to be desaturating. So this is a simple slide to show how we check for pleural effusion. We place the probe marker, a probe in the mid axillary line with the probe marker pointing towards the head and you basically want to visualize the liver, the diaphragm, and then if you see a black colored fluid above the diaphragm, that is pleural effusion of fluid. In our case, it was filled with debris, but it could be clear in cases of pleural effusion. The important sign which we need to look out for is the spine sign. What this means is just below the liver, you will be able to see the spine in normal patients. But then below the lung, you will not be able to see the spine because the lung is filled with air and ultrasound does not penetrate well through air. But whenever there is an effusion or fluid above the diaphragm, you can see the spine extending even below the lung, which is called the spine sign. And uh, so the bottom line is ultrasound is a great tool to troubleshoot patient causes of post intubation desaturation uh, and plenty of these diagnoses can be found easily at the bedside uh, using an ultrasound. So yeah, when patient is desaturating who has been intubated, you can use ultrasound to find out if there are, after you've done your DOPS, the machine part of it, the tube uh, and also secretions and other things to see patient related causes of desaturation, ultrasound is a great tool. Thank you. Thanks, Judson. Yeah, there was, uh, yes, yeah, so we have a comment. Uh, wow, that's what pus looks like on ultrasound. So yes, we any any kind of fluid is, you, you know, ultrasound loves to look at fluid. So any kind of fluid or liquid is easily seen with with the help of ultrasound. The, sometimes if it's quite thicker or if it's uh, got lots of debris, it might become, but ultrasound is quite great at picking up fluids. Any questions for Judson? 
Yes, Conrad. Just do you mind showing your plural effusion again? Go back. Uh, do, you, do you mean this slide? Uh, I, I only see end of slideshow still. Oh. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So it's just, it was an interesting point because what you saw is good in that why you can see past lungs in that case, it's just the compression versus obstructive atelectasis that I saw. The pleural effusion sometimes pushing that lung so tight that it becomes dense tissue, liver-like again, mm -hmm. from outside pressure. And that's where you can see all the way through to the back of the lung. And it, even though it should be aerated, it's compressed into eight electrices and you can see all the way back. You just had a good picture. I wanted to like, show that picture. Able to see now? Uh, just, is, is it, I just like the picture. Sure, sure. I think it was the second last uh, slide where you showed us the spine sign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, you, should, you know, normally you couldn't, you can't see the lung because ultrasound hates air. So normally you can't see the lung if it's normal and it's full of air. But in this case, it was all squished down because of the pressure of fluid around it. And now you could see. Yeah, and, you can, see, and you can see past it as well because it's so compressed. You can see past it as well. Yeah, it was a group. It was a, Good image, yes. Um, all right, if you don't have any other questions, we have, oh yes, there it is. Yeah. Do you want to- It's just, it's just a good sign about the effusion and the effusion pressing the lung into the compression atelectasis that we spoke about earlier. And if you see the tip of the lung versus the liver, they look very similar. And that's, so the lung is looking and you can see past it not because it's changed from the parameters that the lung should be full of fluid, that lung is compressed into atelectasis, and that's mm -hmm. why that, uh, all the way you see at the back of it, and the spine sign actually continues past the lung. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that point. It's really good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, our last presenter now, uh, that's Chaka. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we'll have to ask you to share your screen. Um, are you able to see anything? Yeah, we can see your screen. Thank you. Um, we'll just uh, look into slideshare. Okay, can you see my first slide? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you, Priya. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vishaka, and I'm a clinical fellow with the emergency department and I am a novice focus person. So um, just to begin with, um, when Priya said that the next uh, session is going to be about focus in intubated and ventilated patients, I was completely out of my depth and I said, okay, I don't know anything about this. Um, so one day after shift, I approached Priya and I said, um, what comes under this umbrella of, you know, focus in intubated and ventilated patients? So Priya being the focus enthusiast uh, and lead took me to a machine and said, come, I'll show you something. So she did tell me everything that comes under it. And then we did a very, very simple scan of the upper airway using the ultrasound on ourselves. And that was identifying the airway with sound. And it was my Eureka moment, moment of focus. And today I'd just like to take a few minutes to just show that it can be done very easily and maybe the clinical significance may not be um, as important or as we don't come across this as often as the other cases that you have all come across. But I think it's something that's very easy and that we could probably practice on each other. Um, so why bother? As I said, yes, the clinical significance of this is only probably when we who manage airways know that the last step, which is kind of a life saving procedure on a patient is to get the front of neck access when there is a difficult airway and we have failed to secure the air airway in all our previous plan A, B and C. So the main point here would be to identify the cricothyroid membrane. 
I will speak about what this membrane is in my next slide, and I'm sure all of us know. So normally, clinically, it is identified by palpation. Um, it's just uh, by identifying the Adam's apple coming down, feeling for the cricoid ring, and then in between uh, the thyroid and cricoid cartilages, you find the membrane in the midline and mark your point. This does, um, it's, it's in normal patients, it's easy to find, but in the obese and anybody who has any form of altered anatomy in the neck, it's going to be the, the ability to find it, the incidence drops down to less than 40% of being in the right place. So can POCUS help here? Yes, it can. There are a few studies and um, case reports. It, it doesn't take very long, less than a, a minute to find the cricothyroid membrane with POCUS, and it's a skill that you could acquire with minimal training. Uh, before we go on to what Priya and me did on, uh, you know, to scan our uh, airways, I just wanted to show the point that we are looking to. So the the main anatomy is the shield shaped cartilage, which is the thyroid cartilage that has an um, angulation to the front forming the Adam's apple and then the ring shaped cartilage below that the cricoid and between them the cricothyroid membrane and that star there if you can see is where we are kind of targeting our point of entry. Um, similarly, I'm just showing a sagittal view of this. Um, so this is the thyroid cartilage, that's the cricoid cartilage. This is your cricothyroid membrane, and these are the tracheal rings. Um, and we'll see why this image is significant later. Um, before, as usual, before any scan, um, it is important to prepare the so position of the patient. So I was standing while I was looking at my cricothyroid membrane, but the post position of the patient in most instances would be that the patient is supine or if there is a need maybe with a 30 degree head tilt. Now I think uh, if you were to use this though it's going to be in very very rare circumstances you would probably want the patient's position not to be changed or the position in which you would find the and mark your point is the position in which the final procedure is to be done. The probe, so um, the few studies that I looked up, I know this was discussed and Yasser did have um, suggestions, but because this, these structures are all superficial and the neck does have a round uh, cylindrical contour to it, the, the transverse or high frequency linear probe is what I have found was used in most instances. And there are two ways that this scan can be done and we'll go to that. So, um, one way to do this is to have the probe uh, transversely across the patient's neck. So if you just look at the pictures, this is the position. You would have the marker to the right of the patient and begin just approximately where your hyoid bone is and start migrating down along the neck. The images that we see, so the first thing that we are trying to identify is if you're, pres if you're just at below the Adam's apple, is the thyroid cartilage. Uh, going back to anatomy, this is what we are trying to look at, the triangular structure that looks like a volcano or mountain that you can see is your thyroid cartilage. As you move down, we're trying to now identify the cricothyroid membrane. Uh, Yasser did mention about air tissue interface forming a white line and this is where I have we find the cricothyroid membrane. And in a picture, this is what we are looking at to correlate with the ultrasound I have. If we go further down, then we come to the cricoid, which is a thick, curved, quite anteriorly positioned ring-like structure. We will not be able to see the entire ring because sound doesn't pass through air, but the front is quite anteriorly present and just below the cricothyroid membrane. So this is, um, you see the thyroid, you see the air, you see the cricoid, and then you go back to see the air line or the cricothyroid membrane. And this is where we are targeting to enter the trachea. Um, the other way of doing this is by, uh, before we go on, I think I have a video that should play. This is a while um, my first attempt and um, learning from Priya of trying to identify structures. So we 
begin by locating the thyroid cartilage which looks like a conical mountain and you can see the vocal cords moving inside then we move down to locate the white structure which is the air tissue interface at the cricothyroid membrane and then move further down to the c-shaped semicircular cartilage which is the cricoid itself and if we go further down we can see a tracheal ring with the thyroid gland on both the sides and then we come back up again to see the cricoid located there. Then the longitudinal view or the um, is another way of doing it where the probe eventually we see the images in the longitudinal view but we begin with the probe in a transverse view just above the suprasternal notch and we identify the tracheal rings which i will show you ahead and then with the marker to the right of the patient then a 90 degree turn of the probe to get the marker towards the head end of the patient and then we continue. So the first image that you would see is this one where you find the tracheal ring it's and you see the thyroid gland surrounding the tracheal ring. So this is the image that we are trying to correlate with the ultrasound image that we have here. Then after we've turned the probe, um, the first image that you would see is actually this one where we see the tracheal rings as a string of pearls and then you slide up to find the cricoid cartilage and then the thyroid cartilage and the cricothyroid membrane in between. So the final image is this, which you would focus into with the cricoid, um, the thyroid and the membrane in between. And this is where we are targeting to um, enter. The longitudinal view to locate the cricothyroid membrane. In this view, the first structure we see is the thyroid cartilage towards the head end of the patient. The next structure we locate is the cricoid cartilage and between them, the connecting structure is the cricothyroid membrane. As we move further down the neck, we can see the tracheal rings that are one after the other looking like a string of pearls. So this, um, it was very fascinating when I actually saw this, um, you know, and it's such a superficial structure, very easy to locate, very easy to practice because you don't need somebody else. You can do it on yourself while you're seeing it. And I know the instances of one of us coming to do a fauna. We don't know when this will happen, but when it happens, uh, there is no room for error. This is a case report that I uh, have picked Im images from uh, published in one of the emergency medicine journals. So the first image, we see the surface markings. So the two surface markings, the black asterisk that you see is where the surgeon or the airway person marked for the trachea. And then with ultrasound, they detected the trachea to be present at the red dot. And the same pers um, person's CT image shows um, the arrow is where the surgeon would have marked going by the midline and the ultrasound image has identified the trachea in the correct position. Will this, uh, knowing how to do this, will it change my practice? Probably not for every intubation, but if there are patients with altered anatomy in the neck, then definitely yes. Um, so can I identify the airway with sound? Um, I am possibly a bit uh, inspired by the recent SpaceX mission and can identify the rocket from the aeroplane. But I think what I want to do is encourage the adventurers in all of us to get the focus out and try to identify the, you know, our own airway anatomy and probably keep this in mind for application in clinical use. That was wonderful. What a great set of presentations. I hope you have enjoyed today's webinar. I'm very grateful to all of the presenters. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week ahead and happy scanning.